Like any rather complicated machine, and the immune system consists of quite a lot of different cells and molecules and they have to interact in various ways, things can go wrong sometimes in the immune response and you can end up with immunodeficiency, a deficient immune response. Sometimes this is due to external agents and in that case we refer to secondary immunodeficiency. But now we're going to discuss primary immunodeficiency. So primary immunodeficiency is defective immunity that is due to either an inherited or an acquired gene defect. The distribution of cellular primary immunodeficiency defects is that around about half of them are caused by defects in B cells and therefore in antibody production. Around about 20% of primary immunodeficiency defects are combined T and B cell defects. Approximately 20% affect the phagocytic cells and around about 10% affect just the T cells without affecting other parts of the immune response. The consequences of primary immunodeficiency are that we see opportunistic infections these are infections that most of us, most of the time, are not really troubled by. We will deal with them perfectly adequately. Um, but in patients with primary immunodeficiency, these infectious agents take the opportunity of the fact that there is a defective immune response to establish disease. The type of infections actually reflects the defect. So a defect in phagocytic cells will result in a different spectrum of infections to, for example, a defect in B lymphocytes. Immunodeficiency affecting T cells results in predominantly intracellular infections, for example, viruses, mycobacteria, and so forth. Whereas immunodeficiency affecting phagocytic cells and B cells and complement mainly results in extracellular bacteria, a little bit of background about primary immunodeficiency. Most primary immunodeficiencies are caused by an inherited gene defect. Although, as already mentioned, some are due to spontaneous mutations. The inheritance may be autosomal recessive, in other words, both copies need to be defective, or autosomal dominance, where only one copy needs to be defective. Others are X-linked and therefore more common in boys than girls. The severity will vary depending on the nature of the mutation. These diseases tend to manifest themselves in infancy. The vast majority of them are inherited gene defects. Therefore, you tend to pick them up in the early years of life. When infants are a few months or one or two years old, they'll keep getting recurrent infections, they'll be investigated for this, and in some of those individuals, they will be found to have a primary immunodeficiency. Most primary immunodeficiencies have a low prevalence. They're fairly rare diseases, generally speaking. However, the study of primary immunodeficiencies has provided valuable insights into individual components of the immune response. So although they're relatively uncommon, it's enabled us to answer questions about how the immune system functions because we can identify individuals that have one particular component of the immune system that is dysfunctional due to these inherited gene defects. As already mentioned, quite a few primary immunodeficiencies are caused by genes that are present in the X chromosome, and therefore these diseases are more common in boys. And here is a list of some of the X-linked primary immunodeficiencies. And as you can see, there are a number of these, and we will be discussing some of these uh, a little later in this lecture. Examples of primary immunodeficiencies that affect the innate response include complement deficiencies, proximal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, hereditary angioedema, chronic granulomatous disease, myeloperoxidase deficiency, 
glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, the leukocyte adhesion deficiency, Chediakagashi syndrome, and a number of auto-inflammatory disorders. Looking at complement deficiencies, any one of the many different complement components can be affected. For example, if there is a defective gene encoding the complement components C1Q, C1R, C1S, C2, C3, C4, or factor I, there will be impaired clearance of immune complexes. And this can result in the condition systemic lupus erythematosus, which is an autoimmune disease. And typical infections seen when there is deficiency of these particular complement components include a number of pyogenic bacteria. Deficiencies in the later complement components, C6, C5, C6, C7, C8, C9, factor D, propidin, this will lead to a range of other types of infections, particularly disseminated Neisseria infections. MASP2 deficiency, one sees an increased instance of Streptococcus pneumoniae, and in mannose binding lectin deficiency, which has quite a high prevalence for a primary immunodeficiency, in fact, it's one of the most prevalent primary immunodeficiencies, uh, there is usually no consequence. So most people with mannose binding lectin deficiency don't even know they've got it. And the same is true of another relatively common primary immunodeficiency, which is selective IgA deficiency. Again, usually other parts of the immune response compensate for the lack, and uh, one doesn't see a greatly increased instance of particular infections. One interesting complement regulatory component deficiency is proximal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, PNH. In this disease, there is a mutation in the pig A gene. This encodes an alpha 16 n acetyl glucosaminal transferase, which results in an inability to synthesize the glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol, or GPI, anchors. And a lack of these GPI anchors mean that complement control proteins CD55 and CD59 are absent from the surface of erythrocytes. And this means that these erythrocytes are susceptible to complement-mediated lysis. So normally, CD55, which requires a GPI anchor to hold it onto the cell surface of the erythrocyte, this molecule, CD55, inhibits the C3 convertase, which is necessary for complement activation. Likewise, CD59, which also requires a GPI anchor to hold it on the surface of the erythrocyte, this functions to prevent insertion of the membrane attack complex. So in the absence of the, these GPI anchors, neither of these molecules is present on the surface of the red blood cell, and the membrane attack complex can cause lysis of the red blood cell, resulting in PNH. Hereditary angioedema is due to a C1 inhibitor deficiency. C1 inhibitor is required to regulate the uncontrolled activation of the coagulation system. So in its absence, there is excessive clotting. It's also required to regulate the complement system, and in its absence, there is excessive production of activated complement components, resulting in inflammation and cell lysis. And it also is involved in regulating the kinin system. So there is excessive production of bradykinin and endothelial cell activation as a result. There are a number of gene defects that can affect phagocytic cells, and these are listed here. Defective genes for components of the NADPH oxidase can result in chronic granulomatous disease. And here we see a number of typical infections with an increased instance and severity of disease with Staph aureus, Aspergillus fumigatis, uh, Candida albicans, and so on. A Defect in the CD18 beta subunit, CD18 is an integrin adhesion molecule, leads to leukocyte adhesion deficiency type 1. 
we see an increased incidence of pyogenic bacteria. In contrast, a defective gene for the GDP fucose transporter leads to leukocyte adhesion deficiency or LAD2. Again, with an increased incidence of pyogenic bacteria, kinlin 3 deficiency leads to leukocyte adhesion deficiency type 3, again with an increased incidence of pyogenic bacteria. And then a defect in the LIST gene leads to the disorder called Chediak-Higashi syndrome and a range of Staphylococci and Streptococci uh, and other species are seen with an increased incidence in this condition. Let's have a look in a little bit more detail at chronic granulomatous disease. In the vast majority of patients, this is due to a defect in subunits of the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate oxidase, the NADPH oxidase. It affects monocytes, macrophages and neutrophils, and they fail to produce reactive oxygen intermediates that are required to kill engulfed microorganisms. The NADPH oxidase consists of a number of different subunits, as you can see here. The function of this oxidase is to produce reactive oxygen species that are involved in killing engulfed microorganisms. A defect in the gene encoding the GP91 FOX component of the NADPH oxidase is the X-linked form of this disease because that gene is present on the X chromosome. The genes for the other components of the NADPH oxidase are found on the non-sex chromosomes, in other words, the autosomes, and the autosomal recessive P22 FOX, P47 FOX, P40 FOX, or P67 FOX variants of chronic granulomatous disease are caused by gene defects in these particular autosomal genes. In a minority of patients, rather than having gene defects in components of the NADPH oxidase, there can be genetic mutations in the myelin peroxidase or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase genes. This leads to a similar but less severe phenotype in these patients. Turning now to leukocyte adhesion deficiency. As we've already heard, there are three types. LAD type 1 is due to a lack of the CD18 beta subunit of the beta 2 integrins. LAD type 2 is due to defective GDP fucose transporter and therefore an inability to fucosylate Sial Lewis X structures. Whereas LAD type 3 is due to a mutation in the integrin activation mono molecule Kindlin 3. So any one of these three gene defects in different ways can lead to defective adhesion of leukocytes and compromise the ability to fight infection. In Chediak-Higashi syndrome, there's a defect in the list lysosomal trafficking gene. There's an accumulation of giant intracytoplasmic granules. This is due to defective migration of the late endosomal lysosomal compartment within the cell, which interferes with the correct function of these cells. There is dysfunction of neutrophils, of natural killer cells, and of cytotoxic T cells. And here we can see a neutrophil with these giant granules accumulating within the cell, and this compromises the function of the cell. Likewise, in the natural killer cell and in the cytotoxic T cell, these large granules accumulate in the cytoplasm and interfere with the correct activity of the cell. Patients suffer from a range of pyogenic infections, particularly with Staph aureus, Strep pyogenes, pneumococci, Aspergillus species, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. <music>